Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Ted and uh, the phenomenal team they have for inviting me. Um, before I bore you with some science, I have to tell you the first moment, since the theme of today is moments, how I got to be here at TEDx Patras. Two weeks ago, I was giving a lecture at a scientific meeting in Athens. And I was walking back from the meeting down Vasily Sofias Avenue, and I passed a car, and there were two gentlemen sitting, one was sitting in the seat of the car with the door open, and one was sitting outside, and they had tags like this, but I didn't read the tags. They looked at me, I looked at them, they looked at me funny, I looked at them back funny, and I started walking down the street. And being somebody who grew up in New York City, I'm always conscious of who's behind you. So these two people are following me. So I keep looking back. Now I'm starting to think I have a backpack with a computer. If I swing the backpack, I'm going to hurt them. This is maybe I can fight them off. Um, it's not going to be so bad. Um, if I kick one, then I can punch the other one. And so I stop at the light. I stop at the light, and they come up to me and say, Mr. Zautis. And I said, yes. And they said, we know you. We know you. And I said, Okay, I don't know you. And they said, we have been sending emails and we want to invite you to TEDx Patras because we've seen your picture and you walked down the street and we recognized you. I said, okay. And they said, can we buy you a cup of coffee? And I said, where? And they said, we could go there, down the street. And I said, okay, we can go there. That's how I got to TEDx Patras today. That was my first moment. Um, <laughs> So thank you to both of the gentlemen who didn't mug me and take my wallet and take my money. Um, so I, I feel a little intimidated because we heard so many great uh, philosophers, people talk about life stories, and I'm going to bring it down to some more basic uh, science today. Um, I want to know what kills 3,000 Greek citizens a year? Infections acquired in hospitals. 3,000 Greek citizens a year. And many, many more worldwide. But Greece has specifically a pretty significant problem with what we call hospital acquired infections. So you go into the hospital, like Thoduri said, and you come out with either you don't come out or you come out with multiple problems due to something you caught in the hospital. You go to the operating room and you come up with a complication related to, the, to your operation. More importantly, the majority of these infections, and I'll get back to telling you a little bit more about those, are caused by antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Bacteria for which the, currently, the antibiotics we currently have are no longer effective. Um, we are about to enter something called the post-antibiotic era an era that will take us back to the time before World War II, before Fleming developed penicillin. We are running out of antibiotics. The World Health Organization has listed antibiotic resistance and antibiotic resistant infections as, three, as number three in the global threats to health, to public health. So a little biology. We, and I know you're sitting there, I'm gonna scare you a little bit, we, we humans are about 37 trillion cells. I want you to feel a little icky now. There are about 39 trillion bacteria cells crawling on you, inside of you, um, and, and in all our uh, orifices. We are more bacteria than we are human cells. When you expose those bacteria to antibiotics, they are much smarter than we are. We've evolved over generations and ages, bacteria evolve over hours and days. So they evolve to become resistant to antibiotics very, very quickly. They're much smarter than we are. So the more we use antibiotics, um, and the more we use them inappropriately, because actually, m myself included, I'm a physician, most doctors, about 50% of the antibiotics we prescribe are inappropriate or unnecessary. So we've created this problem now, and Greece particularly has a very big problem with this. And many other Southern European countries, I'm looking at my Italian and French friends there, um, have this problem with abuse of antibiotics. Greece has the highest rate of antibiotic consumption in the European Union. 
and the highest rate of antibiotic resistance in the European Union and among many of the developed uh, countries. So we have to think about how we're going to break this, um, this antibiotic habit. I mentioned earlier, I started off talking about infections that happen in the hospital. I said most of these are antibiotic resistant. So let's take a step back. I want to tell you a little bit about these healthcare acquired infections and why it's so important that we do something about them. So what are they? What happens, literally what happens when you go in the hospital? You go in the hospital and doctors, and I think I have some doctor colleagues here, place tubes in us or in our relatives or our family members, tubes that are needed to deliver medicines that could save our lives, tubes that help us breathe. Um, every time we breach the natural barrier, our skin, and put tubes in it, in ourselves, we expose ourselves to, to the risk of getting an infection. Our natural state is not to have tubes in our bodies. Um, so the, um, you increase the risk, and then if those tubes are not handled properly, uh, and what do I mean handle properly? Hands and practices. What are the practices around the appropriate handling of those tubes? One gets an infection, especially when there are a lot of germs hanging around, which, which happens in hospitals. The other way you get healthcare-acquired infections is by transmitting infections from one person to the other. You're laying in the hospital, and the person next door has a cold or has diarrhea, the physician doesn't wash their hand or their nurse doesn't wash their hand, and all of a sudden, you came in for your broken leg and now you have diarrhea and pneumonia. So just transmission of germs among cells. And then finally, a surgical infection. So you go into the operating room, if best practices are not adhered to, you come out with an infection that complicates what should have been a very simple surgery. Which brings me to the next moments the uh, World Health Organization um, has um, put out, there are five moments of hand hygiene. There are literally five moments. That's what the campaign is, the five moments of hand hygiene. How we should wash our hands appropriately. We, as healthcare professionals, cannot seem to wash our hands. I don't know what it is. Is it because it's so simple that we think it's ridiculous? But if you read the scientific literature, it is the most effective way to prevent infections. Why should we present, prevent them beyond the 3,000 deaths? Like we needed another reason beyond 3,000 dead people a year in this country? Um, it cost the Greek healthcare system 1.2 billion euro a year. So I want you to think about that for a minute. A, 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 a country in the financial crisis that Greece is in right now pays 1.2 billion for, to manage these healthcare-acquired infections. Many cynics will say that this is part of doing business. This is what happens if you go to a hospital. This is what happens. This is unavoidable. The most important thing to take away from all this is that about 70% of these infections are preventable. So this has happened across the world, preventable. There are countries that have gotten to zero infections in their hospitals. Um, and I start off by saying hand hygiene, but there are other very simple basic practices that could be followed, but we Greeks don't like to follow rules. We don't like to follow guidelines, we don't like to follow algorithms. Um, and hence, we've created this very large problem that is preventable in terms of both lives lost and money saved for a system that could use that money uh, for something else. My personal moment and why I'm here talking about this, I was uh, sitting in my office at the University of Pennsylvania, I had been just promoted to professor at a reasonably young age, um, and I was thinking about what what do I want to do? What do I want to do with my life? What's next? I, need, I, I wanted something beyond writing another research paper um, um, or presenting at another scientific meeting. And what I tell people is that I'm bipolar. I don't mean bipolar as in really mentally ill, although I may be, but um, that I'm half Greek, half American. And the, the Greek side of me um, 
um, started really pulling at me. And the, it was at the time of the financial crisis. And I said, what do I know how to do? I know how to do infectious diseases. This is what I've been trained to do in the States. This is what I could do. So how can I contribute and try to help um, in, in this time of crisis and at a time when the healthcare system was really uh, feeling the burden of these uh, hospital-acquired infections. My colleague Nikos talked about Nikos Kazadzakis, who's one of my favorite uh, authors as well, and I thought about uh, Report to Greco, and I thought, what do I want to report to Greco when I get to sort of the end of my career and my life? So I, I came to Greece, and, uh, and I started a non-governmental organization called CLIO, which is dedicated to um, preventing hospital-acquired infections, reducing antibiotic resistance, and improving our use of antibiotics. Um, and we um, got together a bunch of young people like yourselves who either didn't have jobs or wanted something more important to do, and uh, we came together as an NGO that's uh, been funded uh, with uh, help of the Stavros Niarskos Foundation, which has invested in, in this, um, what I think they perceive um, as important uh, work. What do we do? We do a lot of really simple things, and I love the simplicity of what we're doing right now. Trying to, first of all, we try to measure the problem. One of the things that um, um, was missing is how big is the problem? How big is the problem in Hospital A, Hospital B, Hospital C? And actually, just measuring the problem sometimes helps because people start comparing themselves to each other and say, why do I have a bigger problem than you? Maybe I should do something better. Maybe I should try to improve myself. Um, and then, uh, just um, like the, uh, the Research Institute or the Institute that's working on car injury, we implement interventions, very simple interventions. How do we educate people on proper hand washing? How do we get and motivate them to wash their hands um, uh, more frequently? And most of the interventions are, um, I hate to say, um, not, they don't require a lot of technology. The airline industry is the safest industry in the world. Do you know why? They use checklists. They use safety checklists. They don't leave it to the pilot to think about whether before takeoff or before landing they've created a safe environment for the, the plane to take off. In medicine now, we've begun to use these checklists as well. This is what I have to do as a doctor, and if I check all the boxes, chances are my patient will do well. Um, we as physicians, in general, don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to think that medicine is not magic and following a guideline or a checklist is something that we don't like to do. But we need to do more of it if we want to um, uh, create a better environment in terms of patient safety and quality, specifically around infections, but I would say even um, uh, more uh, uh, broadly uh, than that. Um, the, uh, the final moments, and I don't want to talk about negative moments, but I think you've heard some of these things and you probably know them. What I heard, the moments that I kept hearing things like, the borume na tokanume, we can't do it. We can't do it here, you can't do this in Greece. Aftesine Americanes, they come from the United States, you can't do that here, this is impossible. Infections are part of doing business. And, um, you know, I, that hasn't seemed to, um, to, to stop us. I think we're, we're, we're still fighting this battle, and I encourage you to um, learn more about this problem, because I think 3,000 dead people a year is pretty important, and if you can prevent those, I want what I would ask you as young people in the audience and others is just to raise awareness, read about this a little bit more, um, and also hold your physicians accountable. When you go to the doctor and they're going to give you an antibiotic, ask them, do I really need that antibiotic? Is it going to make me better? Um, in Greece, we have uh, over-the-counter antibiotics where you can get it at the pharmacy, which is not the pattern in most other countries, at least most, of, most other developed countries. Why, what do we know, we, um, as uh, the lay public, in terms of what antibiotic we should get or whether we should get an antibiotic? Um, and I also encourage you, if you're in a hospital, unfortunate enough to be in a hospital, whether it's you or your relatives or somebody else, hold your doctors accountable. Tell them to wash their hands before they do something to you. Tell them to wash their hands before they touch your yaya, your papu, your children, your mother, your father. Um, and 
ask them, are they following best practices? What are the practices that you're following to keep me safe and to keep me from being one of those one in 10, one in 10 Greek, Greek citizens who enter a hospital, get a hospital-acquired infection? Um, finally, just on a per personal note, when they asked me to give this talk, they told me that I have 18 minutes to, to give this talk. And it was a particularly difficult problem for me. I, um, I'm from Icaria. How many of you have been to Icaria? Good. What is the sense of time in Icaria? <laughs> so when they told me 18 minutes, I said, so you mean 35, 40, na topame mia oritsa. There's no clocks in Greece. So this is very disconcerting. This is very upsetting to me to see a clock here that's ticking and saying that you need to, to, to move forward. Thank you very much.